and hello Francesco and I invited you Fabrizio just now. Hi there. Hi, there. Hi uh, how's it going? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having us. How are you doing? No worries. No worries at all. And thank you guys for joining. We're just waiting for Fabrizio to connect as well. And then hey there. get started. Hello. How's it going? Hey, nice, you? nice to be here. Nice. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely. Um, I have to start by saying this is the first time we're having two people on an AMA. So uh, I'm betting on your guys' synergy when it comes to uh, taking on answers. So I guess this is not necessarily the first time for you guys doing an interview together. We kind of always do it uh, like this, <laughs> so yeah, we, we, are, we are used to it, yeah. Lovely, so th there's nothing new specifically for you guys. Cool, so what we're doing is really simple. Hello to everybody, uh, hey CB, hey Tom, hey Patrick, hey everybody, thanks for being here. Uh, we just want to have a quick chat, uh, the, the three of us for like, let's say 10-15 minutes, just to get the ball rolling, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Is that okay? Sure, let's do this. Lovely. 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 The, the first thing I want to touch upon so that we can uh, we can get into the, the, the topics, we'll get into male brewing typefully in a bit. But I'm curious to know uh, what has your guys' experience been when it came to indie hacking, so to speak, and being in Europe? So we used to start off being very Silicon Valley centric, but now with, with this new movement of indie uh, developers or indie hackers, but... Uh, I, I, I call you guys indie as well because it, it's mainly not necessarily about being alone, but being not on the treadmill of VC money, so choosing bootstrap and all that. So uh, back to my main question. How has your experience been with being in Europe? I mean, um, these days uh, we, we, we feel like it's uh, really location is not that important uh, at all. And I, uh, and I think also the many... Many people share this uh, this belief, uh, especially with COVID and we remote going uh, uh, being the new default. I think uh, actually uh, being in Europe could be an advantage because you can. Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, we know many many more founders that uh, even if they uh, even if they take VC money, they they, they are based in Europe. They have access to cheaper uh, cheaper talent, and actually, I think. Uh, could be an advantage being in Europe. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I understand. Fabrizio, what, what has your experience been so so far? If you have something to add to Francesco's uh, thoughts. Uh, basically the same. I mean, we, we're used to our uh, lifestyles here. We, we traveled a lot, but uh, in the end, at least for now, we, we enjoy our, uh, our lives here. And also, um, as Francesco was saying, the, the cost of many things here is lower. So building a company from scratch here has some uh, uh, advantages compared to the United States, for example. So uh, at least for now, it's working out uh, pretty, pretty nicely. Lovely. I'm glad to hear that. And yes, I guess this is part of this new movement, which isn't necessarily that new, I would say, but it's been a, it's been an uprising at least lately with with this wave of being by yourself. So I'm pretty glad to know that more and more people are getting into this mental thought, mental structure, because the, the whole structure is to be different. And you guys are, I would say, at the forefront of it. Um, uh, I'll get into that in a second when we when we talk about how your life has been while building these. But um, I want to move on to Millbrew now. So your homepage is pretty simple. You can barely scroll and the scroll is just for a informational footer although that's not necessarily a footer how has how has that been so how hard is it to keep it that simple it's been uh, quite a process uh, honestly uh, we actually started with uh, a much a much bigger uh, landing page that grew over time and i mean this is a classic uh, phenomenon even with product building itself you, you start from some something simple and then you add a, a feature here, a feature there, and you end up with this bloated product. And then you have to cut back uh, to, to find the core again, of what you're building. And in a way, we did the same with this landing page. And actually, it was uh, Francesco that uh, at some point uh, said, maybe we should try to do something a bit bold, uh, even if the landing page is working pretty nicely in terms of conversion. I think it had around 8 to 9% conversion rate from visitor to sign up. 
we we thought it, we we could do much better than that, and we also thought it, um, like Melbury is a product that you really uh, at, at least for now you have to explain a little bit what it is if, if you really want to make people understand everything that it can do. But we thought maybe let's try to simplify the landing page so much that it's almost like you're just subscribing to a newsletter. And then let's just let the product itself uh, make the user discover all the features, all the benefits. Uh, but the, the purpose of the landing page in our eyes was just let's uh, make users jump in because it looks like something frictionless that they can do and it's interesting enough to, to leave their email. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we basically uh, like uh, removed everything, uh, starting from scratch with a morning brew style uh, landing page we just, just uh, signed up for. And it was also funny because when we did that, morning brew switched to a big landing page uh, <laughs> and abandoned their, their simple uh, email uh, sign up box style uh, page. But yeah, in the end, uh, it worked out very well. And we almost doubled the, the conversion rate uh, in the landing page with this uh, with this change. So we're pretty happy with it. Uh, but we don't we don't want to stop there. We, we're still testing, and we want to to experiment uh, stuff like having the animation or not, or uh, having some more testimonials uh, under the fold and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It looks great, I have to say, and uh, I. I didn't know the page from back when it had way more stuff, but I know it, it was 90% plus chances that, because that's what you do, right? You start with, with the usual, which is add a lot of stuff. So I kind of, in the simplicity, I kind of read between the lines and I could, I could tell, oh, them two probably had something simple, but then they said, no, we just want, sorry, they, they two had something complicated, but eventually they scrapped that for something simple. So you double conversion rates, what morning brew changed uh what's what's coming up next in terms of uh how you decide because you keep adding more stuff as time goes by whether that's features or as you said the uh testimonials how is going to be your process for deciding what stays in and what stay has to stay out uh frank you wanted to take this one you mean in terms of feature or as regard the, to the landing page? Anything. I mean, you, you guys are going to keep adding features, whether more or fewer, you're going to add some as time goes by and more and more stuff is going to happen. So my question is more, uh, let, let me phrase it this way. Apple or you name it, uh, different companies are praised for simplicity. And you guys are simple and are doing a good job at it. The numbers speak for themselves. What is your process for deciding what you're cutting out when you're simplifying and what to keep in? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, we don't have a formalized process, but uh, uh, what we do is that we uh, dog food our, our own products. We use them every day. So uh, we let this guide, uh, guide us in deciding what to keep and what to remove. And uh, <laughs> recently, we, um, I mean, in, over the past few months, we keep kept adding new features uh, but uh, now we are more in a refinement phase and we want to remove more and more and basically we want to uh, focus on the core of what both Mailbrew and Typefully are and remove uh, everything else it was worth trying and um, but uh, especially as with a small team and we, we want to stay a small team mm -hmm. have some teammates but we don't want to grow to be a huge company um, I mean, it's uh, it's really important to stay focused and do a few things very very well. Uh, exploration as a role in uh, trying a lot lots of stuff, but you need to be uh, as quick to dismiss them as you are to implement them and try them. I think because uh, <laughs> um, I've been thinking quite a bit about this recently. Um, if you keep adding stuff, at some point the maintenance cost will be so big that you could be doing maintenance. Uh, 24 <laughs> seven and yeah. we are still not, we are not at that point, but uh, uh, we are starting to feel the burden of um, doing so much that we want to take a step back and focus on what's really working and make it work even more. I understand. And so you said it's more of a, of a gut feeling, more of a, of how you interact with the product, but walk me through the, what goes through your mind 
or maybe it's just a hundred percent gut feeling and you're like uh, in, in a mindful state when you look at the 10 especially now as you said you're skimming down when you look at the 10 features and uh, let's say and they're all crying for you to keep them alive but you have to cut somebody off some of them off what goes yeah. on for your mind then yeah, so uh, let me walk you through it. So we have uh, this product, Mailbrew, uh, which for everyone who doesn't know, it's uh, this product that lets you, um, let's say, unplug from unplug from the internet by creating a personal daily newsletter with your own uh, sources, completely customizable. And this is the core of it. But for example, on top of that, you have this uh, newsletter reader. We give you an email address and you can uh, send your newsletters there. And it's also a read later up because you can save links uh, that you find uh, while uh, reading uh, your uh, your mail brews. And uh, so it's a lot. Uh, the fact that you need to use an end to describe what the product does, it's uh, already a kind of a warning sign. Uh, so basically, um, we, we tried all, all of this, these different features, uh, but even uh, talking with users, uh, the, it's, it's clear that there is one main use case and then there are 10% of people using that feature, 10% using that other feature. Then we, we and so this is actually not uh, only gut feeling. It's, it's uh, talking with users, keeping a conversation going and mm -hmm. also realizing that uh, uh, the way you yourself are using it may not be matching or your, your users are using it. So, uh, it's uh, combining all these inputs and your own vision for the product in designing uh, uh, what to keep and what to re to remove. That makes sense. And, and also, if I can add something, uh, there's also like usually when we prioritize features and we decided what to build in the past, uh, we discussed a lot of stuff. And then sometimes we said, this looks super cool. We really want to add this. And we started working on it. Usually now, uh, we we ask ourselves, does this move the needle? We, which is a very simple phrase, but for us it means like, is this something that really has an uh, has a big impact for us, for the company, for the business? Uh, for example, does it uh, significantly uh, change revenue or engagement or attention? And so all of this is like uh, in this simple phrase, does it move the needle? So we we always ask ourselves this now when we prioritize. And it changed a lot of conversation because now sometimes we catch ourselves discussing things that don't move the needle. And so we stop right away and we say, wait, we shouldn't even discuss this. Like it's super mm -hmm. cool. Maybe there's AI or there's some cool, cool stuff there that we want to use, but it doesn't move the needle. So let's just discuss something else. That makes sense. And would I be right to guess, Fabrizio, that you got to this habit of checking yourself in with this question of does it move the needle uh, after doing multiple things that you know took a lot of time and were nice to make but didn't actually bring any like have you grown this habit into yourself through the I don't have a better word through the pain of spending time multiple times on something that didn't add up to too much yeah totally like everything we we do now all the things we learned uh, it was like through mistakes uh, and uh, it was like a mistake we, we did uh, a few times uh, more than I, I want to admit uh, to just add stuff for the sake of it or because at that specific moment we were excited about something. So yeah, after a few times we realized, wait, we, we, we uh, like worked a ton in, in the last few months, for example. But then we remember just two or three very meaningful things we did. So probably there was a lot of noise, a lot of unnecessary work. And, and that's when the, mm -hmm. the shift happened. So you both got the scar tissue, so to speak, behind totally. this, this experience of, right, lovely. I want to go a bit off script, getting back to the point Francesco was making about talking to your users. Uh, just like I did earlier of, you know, I, I called it gut feeling, but then we and that's why I wanted to go a bit deeper because it isn't just gut feeling in the, not only in the artistic way, but there's more to it. Francesco, you were talking about talking to your users and how that helps. Uh, walk us through myself and the audience about how talking to your users has been for you guys, because the numbers show that you've been doing it well. 
is it fewer aha moments, but the overall average of the feedback, you know, and that sinks in after a couple of days or weeks. Is it a few aha moments, but more of the average that's driving? Do you have a lot of aha moments when you speak to users? Uh, what happens there? Yeah, so uh, we um, we spoke to users before launching the product, and now we even uh, um, we were keeping it as an ongoing practice. So it really has been a guiding principle in uh, using it as a like as the, this metric to uh, assess everything we do. Uh, and I think in different phases, it has a different level of, uh, it's, it's a different si signal. Um, at the beginning, to understand if what you're doing makes uh, sense at all, uh, like uh, presenting it to people without, uh, without passing judgment and seeing if, uh, if they understand what, uh, what it is about, if they're excited. That, that was hugely important. We, we manually onboarded the... Uh, the first 10 users and uh, um, and fix a ton of UX problems that way. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference because especially in the onboarding flows, everyone has to go through that. So uh, it's the it's really a leaking pipe if you don't uh, don't take care of that stuff. Uh, and you kind of lose touch of it uh, work, working on the product every day. So it's important to constantly uh, expose uh, the product to new people and observe how, how they use it to get the, get their feedback. Mm -hmm. And then, as I was saying, we kept um, this uh, conversation going with users by um, by scheduling calls with them regularly. We offer this patron plan where people can pay a bit more to get a, you know, on a call with us, mm -hmm. uh, share their feedback. So we, we kept, kept also the conversation going that way. Uh, and it was really important for us because it really uh, gave us a sense of how people are using it um, and what they care about and what they don't. Uh, and I will give a very concrete example here. Like uh, um, for Mainbrew, we have been focusing pretty heavily on uh, our web app. Uh, it's uh, this progressive web app that you can use to, uh, to read your views and your newsletters and your read later items. And we like spent a ton of time on it. We can say 80% of the development time I went there uh, since the start, I would say. Uh, but actually talking with users uh, over and over, we, we uh, kept hearing just one thing that people actually read and uh, love to read the, their, their digest in their, in their, in their email. Uh, and we kind of ignored that, but uh, uh, recently, I mean, we, uh, we also uh, start tracking a bit better how actually people are reading this, are reading their 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 digests, and uh, users were right in telling us that uh, the their the daily email is the most important thing about Mailbrew, uh, and that actually uh, uh, made us prioritize uh, and decide to invest more on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, it's really important to. Um, it's uh, like a thermometer. You need to you need it to uh, steer to steer you in the right in the right direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, I want to move a bit to the audience now and invite them. So I'll come with the next question. But after this, I'd love to start getting some questions from the audience for Francesco and Fabrizio because this is an AMA after all. Um, I just want to let the audience know if for some reason you guys can't speak at the moment or you're just a bit shy or for whatever reason, feel free to DM me. I can be the voice for your question. I'll just read your question out loud from the DM and we can have it that way as well. Um, my last question before handing over to the audience, Francesco and Fabrizio, how has your experience been with not having a public pricing page on Mailbrew? Um, I mean, we had it at some point. Uh, uh, right now, we don't have it because uh, we have been actually experimenting with pricing. We run a, a three month, three months long A/B test, so uh, with different uh, pricing strategies. Uh, so we, we we don't have it right now because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is no no, and there isn't any other reason for the, for that. Uh, we had it uh, before before running that uh, the test. So the question is how did it affect in any way or was it exactly the same when you've removed the page? Uh, we didn't see any 
I mean, some users uh, complained that we were we weren't really that upfront with pricing on the on the website before signing up. But uh, after you sign up, it's uh, immediately clear that it's uh, uh, it's a paid product uh, mm-hmm. uh, with uh, some limitations if you if you don't pay. I understand. I understand. Cool. Um, while we're still waiting for questions, I'll move on to Typefully. And I've been a user of Typefully, and I love it. Um, tell us in the in the audience how, as much or as little as you guys feel like sharing, how did Typefully come up? How is it going along? And how close, you say, it is? Is it hand-in-hand with Mailbrew? Do you want to separate them more in the future? Walk us through the story of Typefully. Yeah, uh... Fab, you want to do it? Because actually, I think it sure. was, it's, it's yeah. your baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I, I can start for sure. Uh, basically, uh, it started as a, uh, also other things that, that we do and we did in the past. It started as a simple side project, basically, that I had on the, on the side. Um, because uh, during our time building stuff together, I started building more and more of the front end. And so I... Uh, also became a front-end engineer during during these years of building stuff together. And some of these side projects were like a testing ground for me uh, to, to improve my skills. And uh, we, we've all, always been like huge advocates of uh, side projects, uh, even where we, we, we're very busy building stuff um, uh, like Mailbrew. And so in that case, it was like a couple of weekends a work for this prototype of, of this little app to, to create Twitter threads. And it was super simple. You, you couldn't even tweet because I, I can do anything backend related. So it was purely front end. You just started typing and you saw a preview on the, of the thread on the side. Uh, and then um, also when we worked with, uh, with someone uh, that helped us with growth and marketing at some point, we realized that there was like uh, a big mar- marketing side projects potential for this. Also because of the affinities with, uh, with Mailbrew, uh, because if Mailbrew allows you to unplug from feeds with a daily digest, in a way you could use Typefully to unplug from the Twitter feed and just focus on the writing part. So at least some of the values of this project uh, were similar to, to some of the Mailbrew ones. And so we decided to spend a few weeks on it to, uh, to see if it worked as a marketing set project. And uh, it, it worked very, very well. We, we got a, a ton of signups. And if at the start we were using, using it mostly to drive signups to Mailbrew, for example, there was a big buy Mailbrew in the header of the app. And there was also a Mailbrew model where we directly plug the product. Uh, during time, we, we realized that uh, there, there's a lot of word of mouth around it. So we even without doing any kind of marketing or promotion, we constantly have new signups to Typefully. Uh, also because it's uh, uh, almost completely free until now. Um, and then uh, we also realized the monetization potential. Uh, because even with a very simple uh, feature set, uh, there were a ton of people saying, I, I would already pay for this. Uh, we, uh, are there going to be pro features, uh, paid features and stuff like that? Uh, and so like, it's still a product that is very tied to a strategy we have. that is building a kind of, uh, army of Twitter products. Uh, so the, these products that, uh, aim at a Twitter, uh, uh, pro or semi pro audience, uh, like Milbury itself in many ways. And we, we want to build more so they can work together and become almost like a little system. Um, and, and Typefully, of course, has a big role in this strategy. Uh, so in, in that way, uh, for sure, it's a team player. At the same time, it's almost a little startup by itself at this point, uh, because we're seeing that it has already great uh, conversion rate uh, uh, from these uh, early adopters. Uh, and there's a lot of interest for the pro feature. So in the future, I think we'll invest more time into it. And at the, same, at the same time, we'll always think about how to integrate it in our strategy and make it work for Mailbrew as well. And, and for example, uh, when we, we're going to launch some uh, pro features uh, for it, uh, for sure, if we start sending a digest of these features to the users, for example, a daily digest on your Twitter impressions 
on your uh, on your account metrics will use Mailbrew for it. So in the end, there's always going to be like tight integrations between these products, even if we develop them almost as they're completely different startups. Uh, I hope that answered the question. It does. It does for sure. Uh, just to clarify, so Typefully wasn't planned to be a product you guys make and then pre-sale and turn into a completely separate, uh, I guess it is completely separate now as well, but it, it, it wasn't meant to be this new startup, was it? N- no, 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 not at all. Actually, it's pretty funny because, uh, uh, yeah, um, we, we try to implement this uh, marketing side project strategy. We tried the blog posts, the CEO, all kind of stuff. But actually, what we are best at is uh, creating products. And we are kind of fast at it, especially with simple concepts like, uh, like Typhoon it was uh, before uh, these most recent features. So we just built it with an insane level of quality. And when you do stuff like that, at least for us, it works really great because people share it. And uh, it broke to us, Fabrizio was saying, uh, uh, hundreds of signups uh, to Mailbrew, uh, but then we also discovered the the, the other nice benefit of uh, launching new stuff is that you always learn something that you didn't know with with another product. Like with Typefully, that the completely new new thing for us was having a product with a growth loop in inside. So uh, when uh, some huge accounts signed up uh, and started tweeting with it, uh, I mean uh, we have. Uh, probably thousands of people every day seeing uh, mm-hmm. when you open a tweet detail, you can see like uh, where it was tweeted from. So I think, uh, yep. uh, yeah, it, it's kind of uh, growing by by itself, which is uh, super cool. And we will definitely not launch any any other product that, that does not have a growth loop in it because it's really that, uh, uh, that great to have growth basically take care of itself. Yeah, 100%. Kind of like, and I have looked this up because it was very interesting. I see Shar from Bill Flow in the audience, and he has as well. One of the things that I'm going to mention is, uh, just like you guys have it, uh, I looked it up and apparently there's, you know, with exceptions, there's three main things you can do to uh, grow with your users. One of the things is, as you said, have that badge there, kind of like Help Scout or Intercom or written with Typefully in Twitter. Some other people do it in pop-ups. And the the third way would be if you host a page, think uh, status page or stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I I like to hear that you guys said this as a a bit of a high standard, but not a standard for future projects, not to have uh, this this viral loop. Um, I want to remind the people that they can click the button in the lower left corner so they can request a mic for for a question. Uh, Francesco and Fabrizio are happy to, to answer anything for you guys. Until we get a request, uh, let me dive a bit deeper into this typefully experiment or side product that became a main product in itself. Uh, how do you guys think of value for the end user? Because I guess in a way I'm trying to ask you what caused typefully success. Uh, you've you've touched upon this growth thing, but I'm more interested in in the idea phase. So you. Uh, imagine something that turned out to be valuable to people what is value to you guys and how do you imagine like do you just simulate a scenario in your head and you think are people going to use this walk me through the for your mindset in the idea process and in the building and readjusting and all that yeah basically um we are kind of uh, (laughs) uh, we have seen this trend of people uh, uh Basically, people are using Twitter like uh, like blogs, especially with threads. They are uh, um, sharing uh, these uh, nuggets of uh, knowledge. Or uh, the basic initial idea was to create a focused writing environment. Like uh, um, I don't know if you know the uh, EA Writer app, like mm-hmm. this be- beautiful. Uh, writing up with no, no distraction, but build it uh, in a way that's native to Twitter with a live uh, preview that matches almost 100% how it will be when you when you publish it. Mm-hmm. So that that was the basic uh, nugget uh, as a as a as a marketing side project. P- and people loved it. So we 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 then thought how how can we expand this to be even more more useful to people 
actually to people doing what we do using uh, twitter as a as a way to to grow an audience and uh, and uh, build products and and basically uh, as a way to market yourself and your your startup and the missing piece there was uh, uh, what, what we then added uh, we are still working on it which is schedule even more powerful scheduling uh, we we shipped as part of typely pro typely pro a uh, scheduling calendar and uh, the the other part we uh, a big one is analytics uh, so actually uh, that, that helps you in understanding what uh, how how what you what you post uh, works uh, is is it working is it not what's what's working so uh, in guiding you in uh, deciding what to write about mm-hmm. and uh, and there are some tools uh, even Twitter itself of of their offers some analytics but uh, uh, I mean I'm pretty excited because I was just working on it uh, before uh, joining the, the mm-hmm. space uh, we have some novel ideas on how to present data and how to um, I mean, uh, I think there there hasn't really been a tool that uh, took this to where 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 we see it. It could be uh, as a way to really um, help you and guide you in uh, in growing your Twitter following. So this is uh, we are planning out a big launch around this. So it's gonna be fun. Fantastic, Fabrizio. Can we get your input as well on the? On the thought pro- and by the way, Francesco, you're on design and Fabrizio is on coding. Am I am I right here? Uh, it's uh, the the other way around. Oh, damn it! My research hasn't been successful. No, the the, <laughs> the lines uh, are blurring. Don't worry. <laughs> 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 no, no, but but uh, yeah, no, it, it's the other way around. And um, no, regarding the process, uh, uh, Francesco explained uh, everything perfectly, and uh, I just want to add that in general we still always start from what it's useful to us um, there's a ton of stuff we could do to to plan products and decide what to do next like market research on see like what's trending and stuff like that but in our history of, of building stuff on the internet uh, we always felt that if we start from what we specifically need it's always more fun to to work on anything and and also usually uh, if you need something uh, and you know how to build it, it's probably um, uh, something that you have a unique skill set for in, in some way. Uh, of course, you, you might need to, to do something and, and you're not equipped to, to work on it. Uh, but for sure, uh, in our conversation, that was all, we were always starting from, like, this is something that I would really love to have. I would really love to use or this is something that they really need and, and tons of other people would probably lo- love this as well. And that, that's almost always the start of this com- conversation at least. Then of course, there are other considerations like, is this something we, we can properly monetize? Because there are some cool ideas that would be very, very difficult to monetize. And so of course we, we wouldn't go there. We, we usually start from something that can also be profitable uh, fast because we, we like being profitable. Uh, even with a small seed round, uh, we still focus on profitability and uh, and having a uh, big leeway and uh, and being able to sustain ourselves. Uh, we 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 like uh, just doing it that way. Um, so yeah, th- th- those are the things that we usually focus on when when we decide what what to work on. Makes sense. But let's sit a bit more on this. And um, oh, we just had the first request, but it went away. If 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 the person that who was willing to ask a question can click that again, I can add them. Let's sit there for a second. You said uh, this. You mentioned this uh, topic that is uh, widely discussed on the internet of building for yourself. What would you tell the people who build something for themselves, but due to whatever reason, an echo chamber, whatever? They build some for themselves, but they can't sell it. You already mentioned you have a couple of standards, such as can we monetize this? I know you guys made a post on Indie Hackers a couple of months ago, if not last year, which was uh, we gave ourselves six months to make our company work. Uh, What would you tell these people who made something for themselves as well, but just failed at making a business there? Sure, I think that there could be like a, a ton of problems that I'm not like the, the 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 biggest expert on this. So of course, like take my advice with with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think what like there are some areas where I would look for a problem, and 
uh, one area, for example, is, is there some kind of uh, signaling component that I'm missing, for example, because people uh, usually uh, would gladly pay for something that help them signal something to others. So if you remember, for example, the crazy Hey launch, the email service by the Basecamp guys, uh, it was hugely successful, I think, in large part due to the address itself that you got. I, I, if I had to yep. bet, I'd say that 70, 80 percent of the people would have uh, used it, tried it or upgraded anyway, even with a slightly worse service, because there was like this huge signaling component. Uh, and so I think there are some products that are very, very good. Uh, but then basically you can just use them for yourself. So that there's really no signaling component there. And, and that's something also something that we're really still working on. So we, we're not very strong in this regard, actually. But it's something that crossed my mind recently. And um, another thing is, like, does this product really help the user, like, save a ton of time or save his attention or clarity of mind or energy? Like, is there really some tangible value for, for the end user? Or is it just a nice to have? And it, it sounds like a simple question, but most of the time founders and even ourselves tend to reply, no, it's not a nice to have. It's essential because of this, because of that. And most of the time it's actually just a nice to have. And the Mailblue itself for a very long time was actually just a nice to have. And we're still working very, very hard to make sure that it's not just a nice to have, but it's, it's more. Uh, and it becomes actually an essential part of people routine, but, but it's a work in progress. We, we're still getting there after more than a year of working on it. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's probably the, the biggest struggle to, to make uh, products essential, but it's where I would look for uh, a problem uh, if a product is really struggling to, to monetize. Interesting. And I hope maybe now live, maybe on the recording, some people are going to take what you said and apply it. And hopefully you will have prevented somebody from wasting a year, two or three, I'm hoping. Um, outside the startup world, you guys haven't been sharing a lot, a lot like, um, you know, making your profiles the main topic for lifestyle design, such as, I don't know, Daniel Vassal or somebody else. But I got a strong feeling that both of you guys are optimizing for lifestyle design. You're definitely not jumping on the VC treadmill, although you did get uh, some seed and you mentioned that, but still, you, I think you guys, and I'm praising you here for this, you're getting the best of both worlds. So you're trying to stay lean, as you mentioned earlier, and make that leeway and make a profitable product ASAP while de-risking with some seed funding when, when you needed it. Um, talk to us about how you guys optimize your lifestyle or how lifestyle uh, shapes the business uh, life and the other way around. Either of you or both of you? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, yeah, it has been a process. Uh, starting a startup and working on products is, uh, is taxing. <laughs> but um, um, the, the, the thing we love most about it is the, um, the complete flexibility uh, that we have in uh, deciding uh, how to work, what to work on, and when to work. Um, and uh, um, so what we've been trying to do, uh, it has been a process over these, uh, these years, is to um, create, uh, at a very concrete level, uh, create like uh, a daily routine and life that actually is enjoyable, enjoyable and we want to live. And, and concretely, this means uh, um, mixing a kind of a lot of stuff uh, that uh, uh, some companies focus on uh, uniquely. For example, uh, some companies are uh, all in on uh, working uh, at an office uh, and uh, take office space and uh, uh, say that you need to be there from uh, nine to five. Uh, some other companies go fully remote. Uh, um, and completely async, even on different time zones. Time zones. Uh, we do <laughs> we do a mix, and that's what work has worked best for us uh, uh, until now. Um, so, for example, what we do is that we have a physical office uh, that we go to in the afternoon, and by default we are remote and uh, async. Uh, we 
Um, we rely heavily on uh, on uh, threads uh, uh, and um, try to communicate without uh, uh, require, requiring the other person to be to be there one hundred percent of the time. And this leaves us free to take uh, to take a walk in the middle of the day to uh, do sports and basically enjoy life as it happens instead of uh, at specific uh, hours and. Um, um, I mean, it has been great. Uh, and um, the other thing we try to do is to make it fun by traveling and uh, um, changing location often. Uh, not, not that much these days, but actually we are starting uh, again uh, because uh, soon we will be va- vaccinated. And uh, I mean, uh, any other curiosity about this? Yeah, uh, was it you, Francesco, or Fabrizio, who posted the wall the other day that looked really nice? I, I think I commented as well. <laughs> Fabrizio, Fabrizio. Fabrizio, uh, walk us through your design acumen on <laughs> interior design this time, not digital. No, I, I don't actually think I have like that 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 much of a uh, like interior design taste or something like that. Uh, but uh, actually, to uh, continue on something that Francesco was saying, uh, like recently, I I moved the apartment. And and that, that's why you uh, you might have seen a couple of pictures uh, because I'm I'm starting yeah to de- to design the space a little bit more uh, like uh, like to to make it feel a bit more like myself uh, compared to the previous apartment and for example um, I did this with almost zero stress because like uh, I know that we can communicate uh, our times and and make space for personal tasks like this. And when I used to have like a more normal tech day job, uh, this kind of stuff um, felt like a burden for me. I always thought like, where, when will I be able to really make time for this? Or uh, um, how in advance should I schedule this kind of stuff? And will it work with the current projects and stuff like that? So usually, yeah, basically you have to fit your life around work. Uh, and now as Francesco was saying, it's almost like the other way around. And we, we both really love what we're working on. So it's not just, we, no, we don't just want to work the least amount of time possible. It's not about that. It even happens that we actually work a little bit during weekends because there's something that we really want to work on. Um, but yeah, in the end, basically, we, we make sure that there's like uh, a good balance be, between life and work, which is something everyone is talking about these days. But it really, it's a struggle and we're always working to, to, to make it uh, a, a more fair balance, uh, both for work and, and for life, for, for both of them. Cool. I've got more to ask, but um, we've got uh, Akash. I'm adding him as a speaker now. He's got a question. So I'll hold off to my questions. And I'll, I'll just put it, post it as a, as a text question on Reddit SAS after this. Hello, Akash. Can you hear us? Loud and clear. Welcome. Thank you. So shall I ask my question or wait for it? Yes, yes, please go ahead. No, okay. uh, no hesitation. Okay. Uh, so thanks for uh, hosting this space. My question was around, you know, talking to users. We all know that, you know, this is a very obvious thing to talk to users. Everybody is talking about it. But we also know that it's the most difficult thing to do, right? I still get nervous whenever I have to do a user interview or something like that. So w- how do you define a most... Uh, successful user interview like what are those things or do you have any metrics which uh, tells you that this was a good interview and i got so much of uh, signals out of it so what is what are those signals it could be around pricing it could be around prioritizing your features or it could be around uh, adding those uh, must have or good to have interesting question yeah su- super interesting question Th- thanks for it and uh, I, I'll speak for myself, but personally, like we, we had a little framework for these interviews, uh, but usually we use this framework. Uh, it's like a list of questions, but we usually use it just to break the ice and start the interview. And then we go from there because every user is different. So it's good to have a little framework, uh, but it's super important to see what kind of person you have in front of you and, and ask questions that make sense for that specific user. Um, and, and also I, I remember being a lot of, uh, uh, very nervous during the first interviews because I felt that it was a more formal process than it is actually. 
And uh, recently, with the last user interviews that we did, uh, I've been much more casual, almost like when I'm talking to a friend who's using MailBrew and wants to tell me what he thinks. And, and it's much, much better. The interviews go more smoothly this way. And in terms of how to understand if the interview itself has any value, uh, the only question I ask myself is, did I learn something about my product that I didn't know? Because if everything that the user told me in some ways was already on my radar, uh, it's not super useful. Like, I mean, it's useful because there's always some data that you can use, uh, but I love asking questions uh, almost always out of the frameworks that we use that in some way trigger the users to tell me something that I, I didn't know or I didn't think. Some kind of use cases that were um, out of our mind. And, and that's when the magic happens because you discover all these use cases and ways to engage of, uh, with the product that you, you weren't aware of. And the last thing I want to mention, I don't remember who specifically gave us this advice. Uh, maybe Manuel, who is listening <laughs> right now, is, is in the audience. Manuel Frigeri, another uh, startupper. And uh, but yeah, someone said uh, like, make sure to uh, to never put your own words onto the user when uh, when you interview them. Uh, so when when we started the interview, the very first ones I remember saying, uh, "Hello, thanks for joining. Uh, so Mailbury is this and that." Or are you using this specific feature? Now these days, after breaking the ice a little bit, I just test them. So what do you think? Or how are you engaging with the product without using any adjectives or descriptions of the product? Because you really want to hear how they're describing your product. And that's also super useful because sometimes they describe it with words that really tell you a lot of the perception of the product that you weren't really aware of. Hope, hope this answers the, the question. Absolutely, yeah. Super helpful. Thank you. Okay. Can I go for the second Yeah, one? sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so before, like, we as a first-time uh, makers or creators, we always hesitate to, you know, uh, monetize whatever we are building, right? Always there is a small fear in your mind that shall we charge it? or not shall we uh, whether the user will pay it uh, for it or not so what is that uh, break even point where you think that okay this is the right time to start charging for your product and uh, uh, like uh, what was that moment like uh, while you was building uh, which was that point where you guys have decided that okay this is the point and these are the things we should be charging for uh, okay, I will take this one. So the, 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 the answer is that there is, uh, I know I hate to give, give this answer, but there is no right answer about this. Depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, because uh, actually we have, been, we, have, we have had extremely great experience with uh, charging from the start and with not charging at all, which is respectively a male brew and typefully. Uh, when, you, when you ask people for money from the start, it's uh, your you're limiting uh, the, the the amount of, of signal that you get in terms of uh, are are people liking it are they using it because you you put a bar barrier up front uh, and i think if we made type fully paid from the start uh, we completely locked that you need to pay to use this it wouldn't wouldn't be where it is today uh, which is in a much better place um, uh, so it's kind of a <laughs> It's kind of a tough question. Um, so, um, so if I if I if I um, summarizing my my thought on this, if you're optimizing for uh, um, I don't know building a B two B company because you want to leave your job, uh, then by all means, uh, I think it makes sense to uh, charge from the start because the biggest risk there is that people are not willing to pay at all for your product. But if you if you're exploring a space. Um, like this, uh, I don't know, Twitter writing too, uh, and, and maybe also want to, to build an audience or or, uh, or you're just approaching in the I think I think it, building free products and see where they go, uh, eventually monetizing them later, uh, later as a, that definitely as a place. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, my, my, mind, my mind on this has changed uh, with the uh, with, with experience we have had with, uh, with Typoli. I think free products have a place. And when you really see that they, um, 
they start to to to, to grow and to um, uh, th then you can um, um, you you can you can you can basically uh, test very quickly whether people are willing to pay with them for them, which is what we did with with Typoli. Um, testing the monetization was one day of work. Uh, basically, we asked a few questions and gave people the option to lock a price. Uh, at that point, we knew that we had to to build those uh, those paid feature because the signal was uh, so high that uh, we couldn't in ignore it. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for answering that. We've got Eugenie up next with her question. Hello, Eugenie. Welcome. Hey, Daniel. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you again for hosting such a wonderful space. And um, so as you both guys have mentioned, um, that Typefully was a kind of a side project initially. So um, which were the signals which, uh, which told you that uh, this could be a full-time thing and uh, also how you interpreted its, uh, its initial journey? Uh, yeah, the 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 main uh, sorry, <laughs> I, I would take this one. The the main signal was the um, at least for me was the increasing number of daily signups. Uh, usually, the way it goes is that you launch a product, you get a few hundred signups on launch day, and then it kind of dies off. And with Typhoon, we did this uh, uh, great launch with thousands of signups. Uh, and then uh, it didn't die off. It started, it, of course, it, uh, it, it, uh, it uh, decreased a bit, but then there was this organic core of uh, daily signups that kept growing. And that was, that, uh, I don't know if you, if you listened from the start, but uh, uh, it, it goes to that uh, growth loop uh, that uh, everyone is looking for in their products. And when you find a product that has it, you get this slow build up of signups that keeps uh, progressively growing and um, really helps you in, um, I mean, when you have that and people are also willing to pay for that product, I think it's uh, it's the, the holy grail or in, in the hacking, yeah. Uh, and also, if I can add something, and thanks for the, the question, of course. Um, like there are some products where you, maybe you, you start seeing that kind of growth uh, maybe it's a linear growth. It's not, not, not really exploding, but you see that kind of growth, but you're not really sure where to go from there to, to improve upon it. We typefully, we almost instantly understood that there were like a ton of features that we could build that, that could, could be like core features of the product. So not just nice to have, so little additions, for example, uh, a whole growth feature set to help people understand their uh, Twitter account performance. Uh, and then, of course, all kind of improvements on the writing experience itself. So when we started seeing this growth and realized that it was growing that way with just like uh, a very basic uh, feature set that was almost like just a start of what Typefully could be, we realized that there's so much we can do here to make this growth uh, compound. And so that's when we realized probably we should start investing more time into it. Uh, and of course, if you have multiple products, it's a struggle. It's not that obvious what you should work on. Uh, and that's also why recently we started uh, discussing almost weekly our roadmap and what we should work on, because it's so easy to start working for weeks and weeks or even months on something and then realize, wait, maybe we should have prioritized that other product or maybe we're abandoning maybe too much. We should absolutely shift back to it. Uh, so this deviates a little bit from the question, but I just want to mention that it's super important then to, to also always challenge your assumptions on what you should work on if you have multiple products. Um, well, that, that is actually a very good point and uh, which reminds me of uh, one query which always which I have always that uh, so suppose you have a list of uh, features upcoming. So uh, do you prefer uh, or uh, did you prefer that sharing it uh, with the existing users that these this will be our product roadmap. These are the features we will be bringing or uh, it used to be that build first and then then tell the users how, how it used to be for you. Uh, I I don't have a strong opinion on this, so then I I I'll, uh, I let uh, Francesco speak on this. But I just want to mention that 
uh, in the past, we overshared a bit of our roadmap uh, at some point. And usually when you share too much, it's very easy to, to disappoint users. Uh, because like usually if you want to do 10 things, you actually manage to do five because it's so easy to underestimate the amount of work that you need for your roadmap. So probably uh, without thinking too much uh, into this, I'd say probably share 20 or 30% of what you want to do because it's usually what you're probably actually able to achieve in a small time frame. And, th and that's what users care about. Because if you tell users, we're going to have this amazing feature in two years, they'll probably say like, I don't care. Or actually that's super disappointing. I, I don't want to hear that I have to wait two years for that. So I, I, I'd recommend probably share just like your next steps with the users. I think it's better. Of course, then if there's a big vision or there are some like, macro areas that you know you're going to work on, I think it's pretty fair to share them with users. But it's just, if it's just a list of features, a very big list of features, probably I'd advise against sharing like all of it with, with, with the user base. Yeah, if I can add to that, um, uh, a cool way of uh, um, seeing this, uh, this is st stop looking at users as this... Uh, uh, people that you need to manage and uh, start. Um, this is a shift that we ourselves did and look at them like as partners or people that can give you feedback and can, uh, um, It's especially if you're in, an indie hacker and if you um, build in public, I think it's, uh, it's, it's we, have, we have always been shocked by uh, the, the quality and, or, the, or the feedback and the support that we got from our users. So we stop uh, stop thinking of them as uh, these people that we need to micro micromanage and uh, uh, set expectation uh, of. But uh, so and we we share more and more of the roadmap uh, with them and even uh, allow allow them to vote and decide what uh, what we should work on first. And I think this sets expectations and and when you see actually see that feature that you voted on the shift, I think it kind of creates this trust and this. Uh, uh, this bonding uh, that uh, that's really really powerful because then they are not just users but advocates of your product, and it's uh, I think uh, it's kind of an unfair advantage of uh, the way we we do things, and uh, we we will lean into that even more I think in the future. Lovely. I hope that answers the questions, Yogini and. Uh... Thank yeah. you. Thank you as well for your question. Guys, do you uh, have to go with exactly two minutes or can we can we fit one more question before the outro? Yeah, I think we can take uh, one more. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, it's, not, it's not my smartest question ever, but uh, I just want to praise you guys a bit more. You've gotten, I think, not just one, but two shout outs from David Heinemeyer Hansen, DHH. Um, I guess the Basecamp guys are just really loved in the in, in this community, you know, because they've pioneered a couple of things. How did that feel? Was it? Did you guys expect it? Um, t tell us a bit more about the uh, the, the moments when you've seen the different shoutouts. Yeah, first of all, it was completely unexpected, uh, uh, and uh, it goes to the power of. Uh, Cold emails because actually this was this was born out of a cold email email that Fabrizio sent to, wow. to David. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and, uh, yeah. I mean, for me it was huge because actually I learned learned programming by reading uh, Agile Web Development with Rails, which uh, David wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of a big moment. Um, yeah, and I, I think. Um, um, we we didn't uh, uh, reach out to to praise or to we we reached out uh, saying uh, hey we built this do you want to try it kept it super simple uh, and actually that's the way uh, that that's the kind of email that that work uh, um, yeah so it was uh, it was big for us it, uh, we we uh, I mean David even uh, shared a ton of feedback for for Mailbrew so. Uh, we're pretty happy of this uh, relationship and uh, um, or how, even the ways it's informing uh, our roadmap because now it's uh, like it's our prototypical user uh, basically is staying informed with uh, all, only with Mailbrew completely logged off from, from Twitter. 
So, yeah. Fabrizio, what about you? Yeah, no, I just want to say that uh, it never gets old. Like when, when these big personalities share your, share your product, it's always like this big uh, moment of validation where you feel like that it's really working when, when those, those kind of people uh, take the time to uh, write a tweet in some cases or, or with David, uh, he even wrote an entire blog post basically about how he uses uh, uh, mm-hmm. Mailbrew to stay informed. So that, that was like uh, very, very nice to read. And uh, I think something worth sharing here is that, uh, first of all, yeah, what Francesco said, like very simple cold emails still work, uh, even with the busy inboxes of, of people these days. If you write something very concise, uh, on point and tailored to someone that, um, uh, some, some person you really like and you, you want them to try your product, uh, it, it works actually a lot of times. Uh, even if it's a small percentage of time, you, you shouldn't send like two emails, maybe send 30 or, or 50, but usually some work and some amazing people uh, actually have those five or 10 minutes to, to, to give it a shot. And I think something that really helped us to, to make these, these, these people try our products uh, is also that extra mile that we usually do where we polish up our products before releasing them. Uh, and so these people usually try something that is not just the average MVP where it's really rough around the edges, uh, but it's usually something that, that they really enjoy using it. Uh, there's, uh, there's a ton of work we, we do uh, to make the kind of magic happen, and I think it works. And of course, this is not true for everything. I mean, if you have a really like the next big thing idea, sometimes it can be very rough around the edges. Uh, for example, even Clubhouse. It's not the best example because it's basically basically dead at this point. Uh, but he had like a huge success at the beginning and it was very, very rough around the edges. But in the case, it was such a novel idea, almost without any competition that that, that you can uh, like forgive them for, for being, um, for looking and feeling like an MVP. Uh, but then when you, when you have some products in, some known categories or you really want to impress users uh, uh, even with something that they don't really get very well as soon as they try it. Having that extra polish, that, that, that very nice user experience uh, that is very well thought out, I think it helps a lot to convert these super busy people with a huge following that usually don't have time to try stuff that doesn't really look right. And just so we can get the practical as well, I would hate to not not ask this. Tell us about the, shortly, because it it won't take you too long. Tell us about uh, how many rows that email had, because you said sure, but it's like one row, three rows, and and tell us about the title. Because I suppose the title has to be catchy as well, or at least it, it drew his attention. I I have to find it. I probably have a screenshot somewhere, so let, let me check if I can find it. But I think... Uh, actually, I think I found it. Okay, so the title was I'd love your feedback on our new app, David. So very, very straight mm-hmm. to the point and simple. And actually, it wasn't that brief. I'm seeing that it was, I'd say, four or five tiny paragraphs, just basically one-liners. So mm-hmm. five, five, five or, uh, four or five one-liners. So like I'm creating this app that does this and that. It's called Mailbrew and lets you blah, blah, blah. Another sentence that you can check it out here. Simple link, simple signature. That's it. So yeah, it doesn't have like, it doesn't need to be like one sentence. So it, it can be long if it's super straight to the point. Every sentence is necessary and explains why they should give you those two or three minutes. Uh, that, 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 that's the point, I think. That makes sense. Kind of like a, like the Twitter sort of writing where you have a one or two liner just to be concise so that people can can follow and uh, skim through it, right? Absolutely, yeah. Cool. All right, uh, we're getting close to the outro. I usually end an AMA with a cheeky question if it comes uh, to, to my head. It, it did come. So you guys are in an AMA. Can I ask you anything? AMA, ask me anything? For sure, yeah. Anything, anything? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, like we, we, we can just close the space if we don't like the question. 
Okay, <laughs> on your Mailbrew homepage, in that live uh, iPhone uh, mock-up, the working mock-up, you guys have a, uh, a subreddit added there, which is Reddit Entrepreneur. What would it take to replace that with Reddit SaaS? Fingers crossed you guys are not closing the room right now. I, I actually, like, it's not a problem at all. Uh, and, uh, like, actually, recently, uh, I haven't read that, that many uh, Reddit threads. I should actually uh, curate my brews a bit more. And uh, I haven't found the entrepreneur to be too useful recently. So probably a welcome change for the, for the outfit. There we go. I just took your advice and I shot my shot. It wasn't a cold email, but I listened to you. Yeah, cold, uh, cold space. <laughs> in your way. Yeah, doing it. <laughs> there we go. There yeah. we go. Guys, thank you very, very much for being here today. Uh, is there anything we've missed? Anything else you'd like to add, any of you? No, it was a great chat. Really, thanks for having us and uh, already looking forward uh, for the next one. Thank you as well for coming. Besides Twitter uh, and typefully.app and mailbrew.com, what are the best places to reach you? Or is Twitter the best place to reach you guys for following, DMing, or whatever? This is yeah, just for the audience. There, definitely Twitter. We, we're relying more and more on building in public and uh, building our audiences here. So that, that's perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. Twitter. Fantastic. Lovely. Um, thank you, thanks to everybody who came in today. Thank you for Francesco and Fabrizio for your time. We highly appreciate it. I, I love the answers and I loved, uh, wait, I'll actually note it down. One of you said at one point, I don't have a strong opinion on this, which I respect because it, it takes a bit of transparency and uh, you're not lacking any of that and, and courage to say, you know, what, I don't have a, the strongest answer here. So I respect that. Uh, appreciate all the, all the thoughtfulness of the answers. Uh, just to tell people, if you have a question at a later point, this AMA continues in text form on Reddit SAS. That's reddit.com slash r slash SAS, or just Google it, I guess. Uh, Francesco and Fabrizio are kind enough to answer your questions there. And uh, it's going to be a bit async. So over the, the next hours, maybe even the next days, if you if, if they're, they're going to check it. Uh, we've got upcoming AMAs with Chris Messina, the inventor of the hashtag, and you might know him from Product Hunt. Andrew Gazdecki from MicroAcquire, eventually Nathan Berry. Um, just follow the subreddit, I guess, if you want to be up to speed. So uh, that would be it. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.